Every great scientific concept requires a mathematical formula for it to be considered real. Einstein theorized that gravity can bend light, but he had to create a formula for that to be taken seriously. When they couldn't explain the orbit of the planets, Sir Isaac Newton created calculus. And when this guy couldn't figure out women, he created the hot crazy index. And then the question of whether or not we're alone in the universe, Frank Drake came up with a formula. And that formula has been the basis of equal parts skepticism and hope ever since. Conan Skyfire asked, can you please do a video on Drake's equation? You really can't talk about the Drake's equation without covering the Fermi paradox, which I talked about in the previous video. But the basic gist is with so many stars in the galaxy and so many galaxies in the universe, there's going to be a pant load of civilizations out there, and if there are, how come we see no definitive proof of it? The quest for an answer leads to a lot of speculation about what exactly it takes to create life, and more rarely, intelligent life. All this speculation fascinated Frank Drake, so like any good scientist, he created a formula for it. Now, math and formulas can be really super confusing when you just have a whole jumble of letters piled up next to each other, but it makes a lot more sense when you apply it to actual real-world situations. For example, if you want to know how many Saved by the Bell cast members were in this stadium, you'd start with the number of people in the stadium, minus anybody born in the last 20 years, minus anybody who's not an actor, minus anybody who doesn't know Tiffany Amber Thiessen, minus people who have never been on the show, and you've got Zack Slater and Screech. Oh, Screech. Justin Diamond's had some hard times. Justin Diamond, by the way, is the brother of Mike Diamond, also known as Mike D from the Beastie Boys. True story. Anyway, using that same process, Frank Drake's equation tries to subtract over and over and over again until you find a general answer. So, n is the number of intelligent civilizations in the galaxy. This is what we're trying to solve for. r is the yearly rate of star formation in our galaxy. fp is the number of stars that have planets. Kind of hard to have life without a planet. ne is the number of planets that are habitable. FL is the number of planets that support life. FI is the number of planets with intelligent life. FC is the number of intelligent beings who have the ability to create and use technology that we can see, like radio waves. And L is the length of time a technological civilization remains detectable. Now, the place where Drake's equation breaks down, according to the skeptics anyway, is that many of the variables in this equation are just guesses. They may be educated guesses, but still, guesses nonetheless. So let's go through the letters one by one and determine why each one of these are so difficult to determine. R, the yearly rate of star formation. This is something we can actually observe, and the current estimate by both NASA and the European Space Agency is about seven per year. The number of stars that have planets. Almost 2,000 exoplanets have been confirmed as of the recording of this video, and new ones are being discovered almost on a daily basis. At this point, most astronomers believe that the ratio is pretty much one to one. In other words, it's expected that every star has some type of planet. But the number of habitable planets? It's pretty interesting. Because what we consider to be habitable is basically just what is habitable to people like us. Because we've only seen one kind of life, and that's Earth life. The question becomes how common is it for life like us to evolve, and that basically splits people into two different camps. Those who follow the law of mediocrity, and the rare Earth hypothesis people. The law of mediocrity starts from the premise that our very existence proves that life must be a common occurrence in the universe, that it's essentially biased to say that we're special or unique. It came as sort of a rebellion to the earlier days of believing that we are the center of the universe and the solar system. It was Copernicus's new model of the solar system that made us realize that we're not that exceptional. We're just another rock floating around the sun. That's why it's often called the Copernican Principle. So this is a much more hopeful view of the argument, saying that life must be very common, and even a small percentage would still create a whole lot of opportunities. But the rare Earth people see it a totally different way. They're not necessarily saying that we're special, but they definitely think that we're the exception. They point out that there were a lot of very unique and specific things that happened in the formation of our planet that made it habitable that would be very difficult to reproduce somewhere else, very unlikely to happen again. And some of these things include a friendly galactic neighborhood. Planets too close to the center would get too many cosmic rays. Just the right type of sun. Not too big and hot. A slow burner that will last a long time. In the Goldilocks zone. Not too close to the sun and not too far away. Has a thick atmosphere and liquid water. Has just the right tilt. 23 degrees. Much larger in the seasons would be too extreme, baking one pole while freezing the other, and much shallower it would just scorch the center of the planet. Has a stable moon. Our moon not only causes tides that move the water around the Earth, but it also works as a gravitational gyroscope to keep the Earth's rotation from changing too much, and it has just the right size proportional to the planet at just the right speed. And the only reason we got our moon is because our planet was almost destroyed by a dwarf planet that tore away enough debris to form the moon. Really, the moon is an unsung hero in the story of life on Earth. Has tectonic activity. Our planet is constantly renewing itself, not to mention creating heat that warms the waters and pumps greenhouse gases into the atmosphere to maintain a warm crucible for the carbon cycle to take place. And finally, below all that tectonic activity is a solid iron core surrounded by a liquid core, which means the two cores are spinning against each other, which creates the Earth's dynamo. 
our dynamo generates a strong magnetic field that protects the surface from harmful rays, but also shields our atmosphere from being picked away by solar winds, which is exactly what happened to Mars's atmosphere. Not to even get into the very specific percentages of elements in this particular planet, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, ultimately carbon dioxide, and water, that may be the crucial elements for life to form. The rare earth people say that all these factors combine to make a very infinitely specific condition for life to form on earth, and it would be very, very hard for that to replicate somewhere else. Both of these viewpoints are perfectly valid, but they've created a range between millions of worlds and maybe none. But that hasn't stopped people from trying. In 2013, a group of scientists using Kepler Space Telescope data said they calculate that there are up to 40 billion Earth-like planets orbiting Sun-like stars in the habitable zones of our galaxy. Since there are 100 billion stars in our galaxy, it gives a ratio of 0.4. So whatever it is we decide is the definition of a habitable planet, how many of those planets would actually go on to create life? Well, that's the next variable, FL. And there are many schools of thought on this as well. One states that if planets become habitable, that life springs up pretty quickly, as evidenced by the fact that studies have shown that life sprang up on this planet pretty much right after it stopped being a giant fireball. But DNA studies have shown that really in its form and function, DNA is pretty much the same in all living things around the planet. Animals, plants, you name it. Which means that it all started from a single place. And if life was so easy to start, then why wouldn't it have started in several different ways on the same planet, also known as ebiogenesis? Some argue that it could have, but the established life beat it out every time. Sounds like our life is the bully of lives. This is why we're spending so much time and money trying to find traces of life on Mars or on comets and asteroids, because if we could show that life was able to form somewhere else here in this solar system, this part of the equation would pretty much be settled. The ratio would be one to one. Every habitable planet contains life. FI isn't any less controversial. It's about how many planets go on to create intelligent life. Some point to the fact that there have been hundreds of billions of species on this planet, and only one has ever developed what we consider to be intelligence. They say that's proof that intelligent life is extraordinarily rare. While others say that the natural trend toward increasing complexity in life means that intelligent species are practically inevitable given enough time. In other words, it ranges between 100 billion and 1. Other people point out that even on habitable planets, the likelihood of massive natural disasters makes it very rare for life to stick around long enough to become intelligent. But even on planet Earth, we've been an intelligent species for about 100,000 years, but we've only in the last 80 years or so been smart enough to release radio waves out into space. This is the next variable. FC, the number of technological life forms. Or a better way to say it, the number of intelligent species that have been able to not wipe themselves out long enough to be able to put radio waves into space. Which we've been able to do despite countless efforts to put ourselves out of existence through war and violence. In fact, I want you to all Google this guy's name, Vasily Arkhipov. Take his picture, print it out, frame it, put it on your wall. I want you to wake up every single morning and see this guy's face because this guy single-handedly prevented the end of life as we know it. I'll put the links in the description below, but during the Cuban Missile Crisis back in 1961, he was a second-in-command of a Soviet submarine that was sailing off the coast of Cuba. They got picked up by an American aircraft carrier. The carrier began dropping practice depth charges to get them to surface, which was not an unusual thing. Usually the protocol was they would warn the other ship that they were sending down practice depth charges and then send them to the surface. This was to make sure they understood that this was just a signal and not an attack. But the B-59 that Arkhipov was on was too far down in the water to actually receive those radio signals, so they didn't know that it wasn't an attack. Their orders in such a situation was to launch a nuclear torpedo, but it required the agreement of three different people on the ship. And Arkhipov, the second in command, was the only one that refused to go along with it. This prevented the mutually assured destruction scenario that the U.S. and Russia had been building toward for the last several decades. And that's just one example of how close we've come in the past to wiping ourselves out. And any technological civilization that can put radio waves in outer space would have to have avoided that fate as well. Now, we've been putting radio waves out into the universe for about 80 years, which is the last variable, L, the length of time that a species can communicate. Radio waves travel at the speed of light, which means that our signals have traveled 80 light years away from Earth. There are nearly 5,000 stars within 80 light years of Earth, of those about 2,000 are sun-like stars. Imagine for a second that an advanced alien species with 70 light years from Earth and detected our first signals was able to figure out where it came from and beamed a message back. It would take about 70 years for their message to reach us, which we wouldn't receive until 2075. By the way, I'm horribly oversimplifying this. I'll put some links in the description for a more detailed examination of this issue. I definitely encourage you to read it because it's fascinating stuff. Now, there are critics of Drake's equation that say that the whole thing is meaningless because several of the variables are open to wild speculation and what's called anthropic bias. Because we only have one subject of study, one planet that we can draw data from, and that planet was chosen by the very organisms that live on that planet. And the scientists call that the zero degrees of freedom fallacy. 
Ultimately, Drake's equation isn't meant to be hard science. It's really more of a discussion piece. In fact, it was something that he put together as an agenda for discussion at the 1961 Green Bank Conference in West Virginia. But the fact that it's only a thought experiment doesn't take away from its importance. Now, this has been a really long video because each one of these variables could be a video all its own. And these discussions help us to understand and refine our place in the universe. It's also helped direct our research into the cosmos. I mean, keep in mind, in 1961, when this was first postulated, they didn't know that there were any other planets out there. Now we know there are thousands of them. Maybe in time, those other variables will be whittled down as well, and we'll have a clearer picture of just how spectacular or mundane our existence really is. Check out the links in the description below to go even further, and uh, let me know in the comments, are you a law of mediocrity person or a rare earth person? If you learned something in this video, give it a thumbs up, and if this is your first time here and you like it, hit subscribe. I'll come back every Monday with mind-blowing topics just like this one. If you've got a question you like answered, you can ask in the comments below, or hit me up at Joe Scott Writer on Twitter, and we can get smarter together. The world is a fascinating place, and I'm here to bring all that interestingness to you, so you guys go out there, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Love you guys.